Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this tour of Iowa forests that we have for you today. I'm Liz Ripley. I'm the Conservation and Cover Crop Outreach Specialist with the Iowa Learning Farms. And we're really pleased to share with you some video footage that we recorded uh, from across Iowa, uh, mostly northeast, or excuse me, north central Iowa, um, as we look at different management practices for different forest types. So a little bit about the Iowa Learning Farms. We were established in 2004. Our goal is to build a culture of conservation by working with farmers and researchers to implement practices that improve water quality and soil health while remaining profitable. And this is made possible through some great partnerships that we have with the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, US EPA Section 319, Conservation Districts of Iowa, the Iowa Farm Bureau, Practical Farmers of Iowa, Growmark, Iowa Agriculture Water Alliance, Iowa Corn, and the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. Some brief housekeeping, we do ask that you remain muted and your cameras off while the video footage is playing and uh, presentation from our speakers. Once that's concluded, we'll invite you to unmute to ask your questions or you can always submit them via the chat box at any time during the presentation. So we will be sending you following today's virtual field day and evaluation. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to give us some feedback on what's working, what's not. Uh, we really appreciate when you send those back because this is just the start of the conversation. The benefit of these virtual field days is that they are being recorded. Uh, so if you or someone else wants to revisit some of the information in here or you know someone wanted to make it but couldn't, you can share with them the link that'll be coming in that evaluation email. All of our previous virtual field days are also archived on our website at iowalearningfarms.org. We're also offering free net gears when you return that evaluation. So be sure to make it all the way to the end of the evaluation and give us your name and address and we'll get you that free net gator. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our great speakers for today. Uh, we've got Dr. Billy Beck. He's the Iowa State University Assistant Professor and Extension Forestry Specialist. We also have Joe Herring with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, a district forester. And Riggs Wilson, a Wildlife Ma Management Institute forester with uh, the DNR. So with that, I'm going to Stop sharing so that Billy can share his screen quickly before we get to the videos. Well, thanks, Liz, and thank you all for attending. Um, welcome to the forest tour. Uh, I'm really glad you could share a part of your day with us today. Um, again, I'm Billy Beck. I'm the Extension Forestry Specialist with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. Um, big thanks to the Iowa Learning Farms for hosting us today. Big thanks to Liz for all her efforts, and thanks to our speakers as well for making this possible. So we're gonna visit five forest types today. We're gonna to visit a bottomland forest, an oak savanna, an upland forest, a young forest, which we'll call an early successional forest, and what we're gonna call an unmanaged forest or um, a forest with a lot of potential, but just needs a little bit of TLC, some management to, to really get it going. So like Liz said, um, most of this was filmed in central Iowa, but the forest types we're gonna be visiting today are all over the state. So no matter where you're from, this is gonna be some, some fun and relative content, relevant content. Um, we filmed on public and private land. So the public land was the Boone Forks Wildlife Management Area and the private land, I really wanna thank Mr. Dave Volkers for allowing us to access his incredible property and allowing us to, to film there and, and spend a few days with him. Dave has a long history of forest management. He's attended dozens of um, workshops and field days put on by my predecessor that y'all may know, Dr. Jesse Randall. He's also heavily involved in the Iowa Woodland Owners Association and the Iowa Tree Farm Program. Two excellent resources if you're interested in, in forest management. Um, highly uh, look into those. We're gonna provide their information um, at, the end of today's, at the end of today's session. So great networking and opportun uh, educational opportunities with those two groups. So the overall point of today, in my opinion, is to get you all excited about Iowa's forests, get you excited about forestry, get you excited about forest management, and hopefully get you interested enough to dive into the additional information we're going to provide in the resource sheet that Liz mentioned that's going to come to you all via email. So again, thanks for joining us on this tour. And before we head out, I'm going to put some slides up real quick. Um, to give you some quick forest facts and two concepts to keep in mind as we travel uh, the landscape today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Oh, 
All right. Well, first to start off, I really believe that forests and forestry are a big part of Iowa. Uh, if you go around the country, not many people at all uh, associate Iowa with forests. And honestly, not many Iowans associate Iowa with forests. But that's kind of a false notion. We've got a rich, rich history of forestry in the state. We've got an incredibly valuable, albeit vulnerable, uh, forest resource here. It's part of our cultural heritage. It's definitely part of our future. And it's definitely a part of who we are in this state. And this, this photo sums it up. I love this photo. This is not in northern Minnesota. This is not in the Pacific Northwest. But this is actually in south central Iowa. That's Jessica Flat, area forester, uh, Stephen State Forest with the Iowa DNR. And uh, if you like equipment, that is a Timber Pro Combo Harvester Forwarder. So really, really cool thing. But that's right here in central Iowa. So impacts, 3 million acres of forest, 150,000 forest landowners, 10 to 35 million in standing timber sold every year, 24,000 jobs uh, supported by forestry. Over 4.3 billion economic impact uh, from that study in 2016 the highest quality white oak and black walnut on earth, arguably. And this is the one I love, is that Iowa State is one of the oldest forestry programs in the US. So not in the Midwest, actually in the US, ISC was one of the oldest forestry programs. So again, uh, we are a forest state and um, it is a big part of Iowa and Iowans. So real quick, two concepts to keep in mind as we, as we go along today. Um, forests vary because sites vary. We're going to see five very unique forest types today um, distributed across the landscape. So there's a predictable pattern on the landscape when we go out there. We tend to see species and forest types located on certain sites. So keep your eyes open uh, after today when you're walking around or in the combine cab or um, just uh, cruising down I-80. Keep your eyes open for this. So these site factors are really going to influence what species can um, compete and survive on these sites. So all these sites have different factors from soil to um, erosion. Um, but just take these example processes at the bottom here. Think about as we go from summit to stream, how what differences uh, we may see on the landscape as far as uh, where may water infiltrate the best? Where is erosion occurring? Where is a deposition occurring? Uh, where are the rays of the sun the strongest? So all these things are gonna impact what we see and you're gonna see some really cool examples of that today. So um, if nothing else, forests vary because site factors vary. And lastly, very quick, um, not only do forests vary through space, but they also vary through time. They're not static. They definitely change over time. It's kind of hard to see because we humans don't live incredibly long, but forests do change. Uh, and I want to introduce this concept very quickly, uh, very, very simplified, but that term is forest succession. So it's essentially a predictable progression of stages um, kicked off by disturbances. And these stages vary in species, structure, and value. And again, disturbance can kick this off. It can also reset or speed up the process. But this is the predictable pattern in general, very simplified, that we see out there over time uh, with forests. So if you just kind of picture that we doze out an acre of forest, we're down to bare mineral soil. We've got a lot of sun. We've got bare mineral soil. Um, what is going to first emerge there? It's going to be sun-loving, fast-growing species, or what we call early successional species. They're going to take over the site very rapidly. Um, there's going to be a lot of brush and shrubs and just kind of a brushy mix in there. They're going to eventually close their canopy off, uh, like in stage three, but then what happens is when they grow up and grow older and start closing their canopy off, we start seeing a new generation of shade tolerant species kind of emerge in the understory. And without disturbance to kind of set this back, they're going to come up, take over the understory and the midstory and just kind of wait in the wings um, for those early successional now mature trees to die. And then they take over what we call late successional forests, which are basically comprised of shade tolerant um, species. So we're going to talk about succession a lot. It has a big impact on management. A lot of times with management, we want to mimic disturbance and kind of control uh, the progress of succession. So you're going to hear about that a lot today. So that's a very quick crash course in succession and kind of site impacts on forests. But with that, um, I'm done talking and let's, let's hit the woods. So I'll give it back to Liz.
Hi, I'm Billy Beck, Extension Forestry Specialist with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. And I'm standing in one of my all-time favorite Iowa forest types, and that's the bottomland forest. These are the forests that border our rivers and streams in the state. They occupy low uh, topographic areas uh, of the landscape, and they're just an absolutely incredible resource. Um, personally, me, I love the fact that they're just so deeply connected with the rivers that they border. Uh, they influence those rivers, and the rivers influence them. So it's just really fascinating uh, a spot on the landscape. And if you look at the numbers, Iowa's got about 8% total forest coverage as far as land cover. But over 30% of our rivers and streams are bordered by forest. So if you do the math, it's really neat, and it kind of suggests that, you know, Iowa is a riparian forest state. And if you look around me here, you see a lot of species that are really characteristic of these floodplain forest um, communities and they're really cool because they change as you move from the channel and even as you bump up a little bit in elevation you're going to see a different species assemblage. So right near the channel we see a lot of heavy flood tolerant species like black willow and as you move away a little bit and you get on, out onto the active floodplain, the area that floods historically every one to three years, you see species like sycamore, silver maple, cottonwood, a box elder, as you get even further out and the elevation gets up a little bit, we call that the second bench. This is a, a little bit better drained and you start seeing species like black walnut, baroque, um, hackberry, and things like that. that those areas are not very uh, flooded very frequently and they're a little bit better drained. So you see a, a different species composition based on where you are in, the, in these floodplains. And all these floodplain forest species are incredibly adapted to what I'll call this very volatile environment. Uh, and when I talk about volatility, I'm talking about flooding. Flooding is the big disturbance here. It keeps that successional clock uh, kicked back, and it allows for these um, early successional sun-loving species to really persist on the landscape. So flooding really brings you a, a great number of things. But if you think about it, it gives you standing water you know, at periods of the year. So that means low soil oxygen. Uh, the species out here can really um, persist and their roots can function effectively in those uh, zones of low oxygen with standing water. Another thing floods bring is actual physical damage to trees. Uh, especially in the spring, you get a lot of heavy flows, you get ice debris, you get uh, wood debris barreling down here, and these trees respond to that by being very quick growing. They're very rapid growing species, so if they do get damaged, they can rebound very quickly and get their heads above that level of the next incoming flood, so they can persist here um, kind of with that flooding interval. The last thing, and this is almost critical, it is critical for, the, 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 uh, for these species to persist on the landscape is heavy siltation. So after floods recede, we get a nice new layer of silt and sediment on the, on the, on the floodplain. And then it, historically in spring, what would happen is that flood water recedes and trees like silver maple and cottonwood release their windborne seeds that coat that brand new sediment deposit layer and take full advantage of the abundant sunlight and they just carpet the area, they take it over, and they just grow rapidly in, in that new full sun. So again, that flooding and that heavy siltation is a disturbance that helps keep these sun-loving species uh, on the landscape. And even the older trees, when we get that heavy silt deposits, they, their roots can either expand or deal nicely in that low oxygen kind of newly buried situation. So really cool adaptations for the trees that are found in these, in these areas and just all kinds of benefits to uh, all Iowans that, that come from these forests. And an obvious one is water quality and flooding. So if you can picture a, a massive amount of water rushing through this floodplain, these rigid upright stems really act to stop and, and slow down that flood pulse. What, and that has big implications for downstream flooding, uh, really minimizes that flood pulse from going downstream. That slow velocity too allows sediment and a lot of times phosphorus attached to that sediment to drop out and enter long-term storage in the floodplain. Uh, another really great thing that they do is they shade and cool our streams, which increases dissolved oxygen. And finally, um, when the waters recede and you get these little depressional areas that have now filled up with silt and organic matter like oxbows and little depressions, um, those are great places for denitrification to occur. So nitrate removal from our, from our surface waters as well. Uh, wildlife. There is all kinds of wildlife benefits uh, and, and, and they use this, these, re these floodplain forests extensively. But two overlooked things uh, with wildlife, I think the first one is the wood. These trees are fast growing, they're weak wooded, 
they break, uh, and they contribute a lot of woody material to the floodplain and in the channel. That is incredible uh, habitat and substrate for aquatic uh, biota in, in our rivers and streams. And another thing too, when they get in there, when that woody debris gets in the channel, they cause all kind of eddies and, and velocity differences that cause scour pools and meanders and you know, all kinds of great fish habitat. And the second thing, which I think is very overlooked, is pollinator. The pollinator contribution of riparian and streamside and floodplain forests. Nobody really thinks about that when they, when they think about floodplain forests. But one really cool example is willow. Willow is one of the first things to bloom in the spring. It doesn't have showy flowers, so nobody notices it. But next spring, check out your willows and you'll see a buzz of pollinators around them. And that's critical uh, early fuel for recently emerging insects in the spring. Lastly, and this kind of goes um, uh, on a lot of people's radar already, but is timber value. So these are incredibly fertile, incredibly productive timber sites. Uh, just two examples. Uh, on our first, our first bench, our, our active floodplain area, we've got silver maple, a surprisingly valuable uh, timber species, especially along our big rivers. And then as you get up into that secondary uh, second bench, well-drained soil, of course you've got black walnut, the number one timber value species in our state. So again, I am absolutely in love with these areas. Um, they're just so deeply connected to the river channels next to them. They influence the river, but the river also influences them. Um, they've got incredible benefits to all Iowans. Water quality, flooding, wildlife, timber value, everything you can imagine. And uh, lastly, they just, those benefits are so disproportionate to the narrow kind of margin that they, that they occupy in the landscape. So floodplain forests, I, I, I love them. Hi there, I'm Riggs Wilson, forestry specialist with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources and the Wildlife Management Institute. And today, I'm in one of my favorite types of forest, an oak savanna. Oak savannas are located in the transition zones between bottomland and hillside forests and upland prairies, and are characterized by white oaks, burr oaks, and various other oak species with wide, sprawling, open branches. Underneath them were scattered various shrubs, as well as prairie grasses and prairie forbs, typically. These areas typically grew on um, poor sites with uh, drier soils and better drainage. This, these areas were typically dominated by fire as the main disturbance type. These fires were often set by either lightning or by Native Americans who would set the fires as a management tool to maintain these more open areas. The burr oaks and somewhat even the white oaks uh, have bark on them on the larger trees that allow them to withstand some of these more intense fires without too much harm. So oaks are a very shade intolerant species, which means they don't grow well under areas with a lot of shade and not much sunlight. So young burr oaks would often stay small underneath the canopy and would build substantial root systems. And when fires would come through and burn them off, they would easily re-sprout from the root collars. They would do this year after year after year, and then once a larger burr oak either died or fell over, and there was a break in the fire interval, um, this allowed them to have a few years to shoot up and replace that larger burr oak and continue uh, this type of ecosystem. Oak savannas provide habitat for countless species of wildlife, including mammals, birds, insects, and reptiles. Some of these species include wild turkey, ornate box turtles, fox snakes, red-headed woodpeckers, and many, many more. They also have, many, have an abundant plant species community in them, including uh, shrubs such as hazelnut and serviceberry, as well as many grasses, including big and little blue stem, bottle brush grass, and Virginia wild rye, as well as a host of other uh, native forb species, including uh, compass plant, butterfly milkweed, uh, and various other prairie forbs. Oak savannas are one of the rarer forest types in Iowa, as many of them have been lost to, due to land use changes, logging, as well as the lack of fire now on the landscape. The lack of fire has been extremely detrimental to these ecosystems because this has allowed the more shade tolerant species to come up underneath. These species then in turn have uh, 
competed with the larger bur oaks that remain, as well as they do not allow those younger bur oaks to come up underneath those oaks, as those oaks are shade intolerant and so cannot take that constant shade from those, those um, shade tolerant species that have now replaced those ecosystems. Proper forest management is needed to maintain these types of forests on the landscape. This could be including um, taking old pastures that are no longer in agricultural production that um, have the right soils. A landowner that is interested in bringing a, an oak savanna onto their property could potentially plant prairie forbs and grasses and then widely spaced um, burr and white oaks in this area to return white oaks to this type of landscape, as well as in our few areas that still have large burr and white oaks in oak savannas, fire needs to be returned to these landscapes to perpetuate them for future generations to come. I'm now standing in an upland forest, and specifically an upland oak hickory forest. So upland forests are all over Iowa, but again, when you get into specific geographic regions, it really comes down to the site characteristics to determine which species that you're going to see on the landscape. And site factors that, that influence that are things like soils and past and current management activities. But there's a really cool example here today that we're standing in the, in the Boone River Valley that I wanted to highlight uh, about why we're seeing the specific species that we are. And that is of aspect, or the, the, the direction that the slope is facing. So we are on a south-facing slope right now. Again, we're in the Boone River Valley. There's a lot of topography here. There's a lot of slopes and ravines. And we are standing on a south-facing slope. And we're seeing a lot of shagbark hickory, white oak, um, some bur oak, and a little bit of red oak as we get down the slope. Um, but the aspect really influences that. And by aspect, um, you can see that the south-facing slope right now, it gets a lot more direct sunlight than, say, a north-facing or an east-facing slope. Uh, it's generally got a little bit warmer temperature. It's generally got a little bit lower soil moisture. And it generally, historically, has had a more frequent fire regime, or a more slow, um, low-intensity fires would impact this area more frequently than say a north facing slope. And that fire is a critical disturbance here. It's not the only disturbance, but it is a critical disturbance. And just like we talked about in the floodplain forests, like flooding, that fire helped to set back succession and continue um, these sun loving, shade intolerant, fire adapted species, um, relatively early successional species to persist on the landscape. So when fires would roll through here, They'd top kill a lot of these small seedlings, the next generation of forests. But the species like white oak, bur oak, uh, when they would get top killed, they'd add root mass. They'd add on to their roots after that. So if, if you take fire out of the equation, or if you do not do management activities that mimic fire, um, you start seeing shade tolerant species creeping in. And they'll shade out the understory. Um, they'll outperform the sun loving species like oak. As you can see, we've got a little bit of ironwood creeping in here, and that's gonna, there's a, a very shade tolerant species. That's gonna set back, and that's gonna kind of move succession forward. This forest with no management uh, or no fire in, in it is gonna slowly transition to a shade tolerant uh, forest. So just succession marches on. Now, if we were to hop to the north side of the slope, which is literally only about 50 feet away, you'd see a completely different species assemblage you'd see those later successional species like basswood and sugar maple, uh, black maple actually in this part of the state. Um, so those are they're very shade tolerant. You'd probably see cooler temperatures over there, more soil moisture, uh, and a less frequent fire regime than you would see on the, on the south facing slopes. So that's gonna favor the shade tolerant species like basswood and sugar maple. And one real cool last thing about the fires that roll through here the species above me, the, the, the white oak and the hickory, if you look at their leaves, they curl up and they, they produce these really nice curled leaves. So when fires do come through, it's a nice airflow, a really nice hot fire that moves swiftly. As opposed to on the north facing slope, if you look at basswood and maple leaves, they tend to lay flat, retain moisture, and it's just not a very good burn. So it's almost like the species 
uh, perpetuate themselves um, how, is how, as far as how they impact fire. A lot of people always ask us, why do we talk so much about oak and regenerating oak? What's the importance? I mean, I love all forest types. Maple basswood is an incredible forest type, very valuable, very interesting. But the thing about oak is we're just losing it so quickly. We're losing it to the tune of about you know, 7,000 acres per year to a variety of factors, but the continuation of succession is one of those factors. So when we eliminate active forest management, when we eliminate fire and disturbance, succession is going to march on and those shade tolerant later successional species are going to take over. And when we lose oak, I, I tell people all the time that no matter if you own land or not, or if you, whether you harvest timber off your land and get a physical check, all Iowans definitely benefit economically from this oak hickory forest. Um, just think about the pollinator uh, contribution alone from these, these forests. Uh, oaks support hundreds of uh, Lepidoptera species, butterflies and moths, uh, as far as pollinators. The economic impact of the uh, forest product industry, they're a backbone species in our forest product industry. The, uh, the recreation value associated with this, the, the, the economic contributions from that, from hunting and bird watching and hiking, so when we lose these, these, these forest types, especially the oak hickory forest type, which we are, uh, it's gonna be a big hit uh, to Iowans. Oak really take active forest management, so we really need to work to, to really keep them on the landscape. That's gonna be absolutely critical uh, for the future of, of Iowans and the future of Iowa's forests. All right. So at this time, I encourage you to submit those questions for, via the chat box while uh, Joe gets his portion ready to go here um, and gets his screen shared. And then once Joe's concluded his presentation, uh, we will take those questions that you've been submitting and get those asked of our presenters today. Hey Liz, this is Joe, can you hear me okay? I can. Wonderful. Looks great. Okay, well, hey everyone. Um, this is Joe Herring. I'm a forester with the Iowa DNR, and I'm not coming to you from a lovely example of an early successional forest today. Unfortunately, I was stuck at home in quarantine when Billy and Riggs got to go visit the amazing Volkers property. So we're going to do this the 2020 version, which is me live streaming from my office over PowerPoint slides. <laughs> So what you're seeing here in the picture is uh, an example of an early successional forest type. Uh, Billy's talked a lot about succession and that predictable pattern or uh, uh, progression of different plant communities of a forest as it goes through time over decades. And, and um, as I think he touched on in the beginning, early successional is really just a fancy term for saying it's a young forest, it's in the infant stages and a lot of people would look at, at an early successional forest and think of it as kind of an ugly duckling stage because it's very brushy, um, it's very thick, it's very dense, as you can kind of see in that photograph, hopefully. It's very short statured because it's a young forest. We've got little tree seedlings out there. There's a wide variety of plants really occupying this forest type. You can see some woody species like oaks. There's a bright red leafed oak this time of year. They jump right out at you. And there'd be a lot of pioneer species of trees, as well as native shrubs, including wild plum, dogwoods, um, and some of the pioneer tree species. Could be some walnuts in there, could be some cherry. If you're in Northeast Iowa, could be some aspen. But also a lot of non-woody herbaceous plants. You can see a patch of grass in the front, in the foreground there, as well as a lot of annuals or broad leaves. Could be a lot of things, uh, could be um, milkweed, which could be attractive to monarchs, of course. A lot of seed producing plants and what a lot of people might frankly consider weeds, but all of those seeds per square foot in a habitat type like this are gonna bring, they're basically the start of the food chain. They're gonna bring a lot of insects, a lot of birds, and then um, on, on up the food chain. So it's a pretty unique habitat type and incredibly valuable to wildlife, which is why we really wanted to highlight it. The way that uh, early successional habit types would come about kind of in nature, so to speak, or naturally, is really just as simple as woody encroachment by trees and shrubs um, out into idle lands or abandoned 
lands. So you might think of an abandoned pasture that's being overtaken by trees like eastern red cedars and honey locust and uh, shrubs. Um, could be CRP fields that are not being managed or burned regularly or native prairies being overtaken by woody succession or encroachment. Um, could be the floodplain scenario. The picture in the lower right is a floodplain site like Billy discussed where you'd have a flood event that dropped a big bed of silt, fresh sediment that was moist right at the time when the seeds were flying on silver maple trees and they landed on that perfect seed bed, full sunlight, and then boom, they're off to the races and they go. And you get that high density, lots of woody stems per acre habitat type then as a result. Now we can, whoops, one too far. We, we can recreate that, um, that condition artificially through tree planting efforts. Or another thought to that is that if we see that um, concept happening on farms that we own where woody trees are taking over an abandoned pasture or site. And if it's trees that we don't like, we might want to jump out in front of them and actually physically plant some desirable stock, oaks, walnuts, uh, certain shrubs to create long-term benefit and gain to us instead of just taking whatever mother nature deals us. But this picture that you see is of a CRP tree planting practice that was put in by a landowner. He specifically wanted Eastern red cedars. You can see they're kind of systematically spaced out there for wildlife cover and deer habitat. And this is, um, this is early successional habitat too, even though the woody plants or the trees are further spaced apart. It's a probably a 500 tree per acre uh, density that we're seeing there. We've got a lot more annual herbaceous growth or some daisy fleabane um, and uh, lots of grasses filling in the spaces between those trees. And that's early successional habitat too. Again, a lot of seeds, a lot of uh, potential for milkweeds, pollinators, there can be a lot of flowers and so forth. Now the sister practice to traditional tree planting with seedlings would be a direct seeding project. And that's another way that we can go about creating this beneficial habitat stage of early successional habitat. This is Leonard Grimes, the late Leonard Grimes from Marshall County. A lot of you, if you're on the call, uh, if you're a tree farmer or a woodland owner member, you'd recognize Leonard, he was active. And this is what Leonard called his instant forest. This was a direct seeding project where he physically spread the raw seed from walnuts, acorns, hickory nuts out across a, I think this was maybe a 10 acre project but it was a, an annually plowed and tilled farm field, highly erodible on steep slopes. And he took, he retired it and put it into forest cover through the conservation reserve program. And now it's sitting there vacuuming up carbon, uh, providing habitat for pollinators, growing valuable trees and uh, meeting a lot more um, compound benefits that Leonard wanted to go for. So, we can, we can recreate these conditions, this, this dense bedding cover and, and brushy habitat through a number of ways. And I'll go back to kind of the look from the original slide that I showed, which is a more aggressive way, an artificial way of creating early successional habitat, which is a clear cut in a mature forest environment. So in situations where we, maybe we have a low quality forest that's understocked and it's undesirable species, or it might be diseased, or um, maybe it got hit by a derecho and it's partially um, intact. A clear cut, a managed clear cut harvest where we clear the trees and replant with new oaks, new walnuts, other desirable species is gonna rebound very quickly. And a clear cut just does not stay clear for very long. By the way, you see some raspberry canes, blackberry canes there in the foreground, which I love to see in a clear cut. Uh, that, for one thing, my kids and, and wife and I love to go pick the berries, but uh, we're feeding birds. And when I see those kinds of plants, I, I often will see oaks coming up through those protective vines too. But the clear cut doesn't stay clear cut for very long. This is another photo. There's a gentleman hiding in the shadows there. Uh, that's John Vogel from Buchanan County. And he had an oak wilt pocket that was ripping through mature red oaks on his timber. Um, and John's no longer with us either, but he, with the help of his forester, in installed a, a patch clear cut there on a few acres, salvaged value from those trees, and um, then he replanted, I believe, with walnuts, and we got some natural oak regeneration, and the tree to his right 
that's twice as tall as him is a beautiful red oak coming up through there. And there's a lot of cottonwood in that picture too, which are one of those pioneer early successional um, colonizers. The final way that I'll just mention of kind of artificially creating this valuable habitat type is a technique that a lot of wildlife managers use called edge feathering. And this is real popular in Northeast Iowa, which is where this photograph came from, one of our biologists, where they're managing for ruffed grouse. An edge feathering um, forest practice is basically a clear cut that's very skinny and long, a linear clear cut along the edge of a woodland where a mature forest butts up to, let's say a hayfield or a row crop or a CRP, and it's a wildlife tactic to soften that transitional habitat between a, a tall mature forest uh, front against a very short statured type of habitat. So it softens the edge and it creates really incredible habitat for a lot of species of wildlife. So I'll conclude this portion of the program by just reiterating, you know, all the seeds, all the berries, all the fruits, potentially nuts from hazelnut. Um, suit a wide variety of wildlife. We would see, of course, cottontail rabbits use that kind of thick timber like that. We would see white-tailed deer bedding in that kind of habitat. They're generalists. We see wild turkeys use this habitat type to build nests and, and uh, lay eggs. Um, woodcock, which migrate through the state, will use this kind of cover. In Northeast Iowa, the grouse, and in Southern Iowa, uh, bobwhites will use this kind of cover. So those are all examples of more or less generalist wildlife species, but there's a lot of specialist wildlife species that also are obligate to this type of habitat. And by specialists, if you think about a, um, uh, the example everybody knows about is a spotted owl, requires very old growth forest, big chunks of it in the Pacific Northwest. Well, um, there's a lot of wildlife that require this, this young stage of habitat, as I've been repeatedly saying, and I'm not, since I'm not a wildlife biologist, I won't pretend to be an expert in all of these songbirds that appear on the list, Bell's Vireo, Kentucky Warbler, Rusty Blackbirds, but these are straight from the Iowa Wildlife Action Plan of species of great conservation need that specifically are obligate to this young habitat type. So um, the last thing I'll say about it that's really gets back to why Billy Riggs and I wanted to mention this type of forest as its own subset is as we look at the big picture demographics of Iowa's forests and the, the land base, most of our forests have moved into a saw timber size class or a more mature later successional stage. We don't have a lot of heavy handed harvesting going on. Um, and on the other side of the spectrum, if you look at our agricultural fields and areas, our, our farming practices have gotten so efficient, you know, they're very clean, there's not a lot of weeds, uh, we've consolidated many fields into big chunks, and so there's not a lot of interior fence lines, and the ditches are getting smaller. So we've kind of boxed out this early successional habitat type across the state, and we're left with just one end of the expect one end of the spectrum or the other. And that's why we really want to promote this. So if you're a, a woodland owner or have a farm and you're interested in implementing any kind of practices that would create this kind of cover, please get in touch with us. Liz, am I still on? You are, just advanced to your unmanaged there. Okay, I don't have the fancy music that Billy and Riggs were um, blessed with. So I'll just keep rolling here. And this is the final forest type that we are gonna do today. This is the concept of the unmanaged forest. Billy and Riggs and I really wanted to end with this type of forest because there's basically, there's a prevailing belief out there across a lot of the general public um, but it also occurs in woodland owners and it occurs even in conservation professionals that I talk to that, you know, forests are a, um, call them a delicate type of ecosystem or they're a stable ecosystem, you could say well, either way, that don't really require management or intervention. And, um, you know, people tend to think, well, the, forests existed for thousands of years and we didn't have foresters for thousands of years. So, you know, why do we need to manage our forests? Um, I think that's a very valid thing to think and question to ask. And 
certainly we go into a lot of stands as professional foresters and we'll size it up, do a resource assessment, visit with that landowner. And we come away very often saying, let's not do anything with this forest right now. Um, it's headed in a good direction. It's headed in a direction that's gonna align with your goals and ownership objectives. We don't need to do anything and, and, uh, and, and mess anything up. But there's a lot of situations where um, the opposite's true and we could avoid a lot of issues down the road if we did do a little bit of management. Or the other scenario I think about a lot are missed opportunities. You know, if we had managed this forest, we may have wound up in a very different place, a much better place um, than, you know, having done nothing at all. And that's what economists would call an opportunity cost. So, as we all recently, well, some of us knew this lesson, but a lot of landowners uh, were rudely um, in, introduced to this lesson that, you know, forest ecosystems just don't ever stay the same ever. Uh, they, are, they are not immune to mother nature. And um, whether you wanna hit the pause button or not, it's really not in your hands or your control. As an example, this is one of, one of the issues that could crop up in the absence of management. The photograph here shows a nice, healthy stand of bur oaks, widely spaced. You could even maybe say savanna-like as Riggs described, but the understory has been completely invaded and choked out by invasive plants, bush honeysuckle in this case. And by the way, this is a tangent, but we're just getting into the time of year that I call honeysuckle hunting season for the next two weeks. These plants really stand out like a sore thumb because they stay green so long and they're uh, basically easy to pick off with chainsaws, herbicides, even foliar treatments. So be thinking about that. But um, there's a lot of other invasive species, oriental bittersweet, buckthorn, autumn olive, multiflora rose. And these are problematic plants that can more or less ruin a timber and really compromise your management goals if they get into your woods and they don't, of course, respect property boundaries and ownership boundaries. Along the same lines, neither do diseases. Oak wilt, Dutch elm disease, uh, pests such as emerald ash borer. We've basically had um, something new come along almost every five or 10 years, it seems like in recent years. And this was even on top of the older diseases like butternut canker and chestnut blight and Dutch elms. And so we face an unprecedented amount of, of pressure on our mature trees right now. And um, th there are reasons to be thinking about how do we move this forest in a, in a better direction other than just standing back and watching trees die. Overcrowding is another common issue that can occur and also slash opportunity cost um, just through stagnation and stagnated growth. The cross section that you're looking at here is a white oak that came off of our family's tree farm in Southern Iowa. It's about a 12 inch diameter tree. Um, well, actually it looks like that's about an eight inch diameter tree. 12 inch diameter is the average of those trees. And these, this was a stand of trees that regenerated very uh, thick and high density, like an early successional um, forest after the stand was cut over in the thirties, we think because of fuel wood or charcoal. Um, but the trees grew pretty well through their first few years of life and into their 20s. And then it appears that they closed canopy and they started to stagnate. And during the last um, inch of radial trunk growth that you see there, there's 28 growth rings. So it's taking 28 years to achieve that final inch of radius of trunk growth. Whereas when the trees were really growing at optimal speed, we were seeing an inch of radius come on about every seven or eight years. So by not having been there to manage this stand and thin this forest, you know, not only have we missed out on, you know, potentially saving half the amount of time it took to grow the tree to maturity, but it's also a health concern because trees that are stagnated in growth like that have small tops. They're not flowering as much and producing as many acorns as they could. So it's a, it's a wildlife impact actually indirectly, but they're also just not going to be as resilient when it comes time to deal with things like drought years, insect pressure, defoliation events from gypsy moth, which is a looming pest that we were looking at, and, and other environmental and, and factors out of our control. 
Another great example, I love this slide of, of an opportunity cost. The tree on the right there is a 30 inch diameter black walnut. And if you didn't know better, you would think it came right out of Riggs's presentation on oak savannas, because that is a true wolf tree. Um, there's no wood value product in that other than maybe firewood. And it's a good example. This tree probably grew up all by itself in an open pasture environment. It's a good example of um, how we could have uh, maybe produced a different type of tree had someone been around to manage that tree or, or um, uh, manage the land around it probably more accurately. Because um, if you look at the tree on the left, that's a, a planted walnut tree in a CRP buffer strip planting. It's about a five inch diameter tree. And you can see it's got some side branches on it that are still alive about five feet up. So making sure that the, the branches on the lower 16 foot butt log are dead and gone by the time uh, they get to be too big to form permanent knots, making sure that the crown has room to expand into and maintain vigorous growth. These are all management tactics that, you know, if we're there at the right time in the right place, we could end up in a much better place over an 80 year, 100 year time frame that the forest takes to develop. And then the, the, the last run of slides here will just be some shots of kind of straight up neglect or even abuse to woodlands that we see in unmanaged forests. We've all seen the garbage dumps in the ravines. You'll see uh, pictures of this with the, the wildfire that got let loose and burned up the trees. Erosion, rutting, this is a forest access road, you know, where um, once erosion starts on a situation like this, it's really tough to get a grip on it. Um, if you're operating machinery in the woods when the soil's soft and wet, you're going to dig ruts, you're going to potentially start gullies. So we can do manage to a forest, even though we're not even touching trees, we're, you know, it's maybe grading the roads and rocking them or seeding them, building some water bars or diversions to keep this erosion from starting. Because good forest roads and trails mean good management and, and monitoring of your woodland to see what's happening and going on. Continuous grazing in woodlands is still something that we do see um, to the point where the cows are, are really heavily compacting soils, leaving bare ground, causing erosion. And if we're not, it's not to say that, that grazing is always bad in woodlands that it can't ever be beneficial, but if we're just letting them go and we're not coming back and managing that woods, we're not controlling invasive species, we're not ensuring regeneration, we're letting the thorn species build up as the cows browse the good trees and leave and ignore the thorns, you know, that's, that's just pasture, that's not really a woodland at that point. And the final slide that I wanted to show here is a little more subtle and under the radar of, of what an unmanaged forest opportunity looks like. This is very common though. And so you just see a couple of stumps, old stumps in an otherwise nice looking woodland. But this is a metaphor for what uh, is borne out every single morning in my household in the kitchen when I stupidly serve my two-year-old Lucky Charms for breakfast and he just selects the marshmallows out of the bowl and doesn't eat anything else. And that's what foresters call high grading. And you know, all he has left at the end of that breakfast is a mushy bowl of grain cereal that nobody wants to eat. So when we, when we, as landowners, and it's easy to blame some of this on loggers, but it's really not the loggers' fault. As landowners, it's our responsibility that if we do a selective harvest, in which we might even pat ourselves on the back and say, "Hey, we didn't clear cut it. You know, we we were a, a steward of the land by selectively harvesting." Well, we've got to make sure we're going back in there and assessing the resource and saying, what's still there? What's coming up now? Is it desirable? Is it good stuff? Is it replacing what we took? That's, that's good forest management to me. And that's why we wanted to highlight some opportunities as well as issues that can come up if we take you know, a hands off the wheel approach to forest management. So with that, I'm gonna conclude and just say thanks everyone for your participation today. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Joe. We've got some questions that came in, so we're going to work through those briefly. Uh, so Riggs, Joe, and Billy, feel free to unmute as we address these questions. Um, so I'm going to toss this first one um, still to Joe here. Are Buckeyes good trees for southern Iowa? Uh, they're natural in southern Iowa. They're a native species in southern Iowa. So if 
by climate and and uh, region, yeah, they're a good tree for Southern Iowa. But it would be debatable, um, depending on who you are and your goals and objectives. If if you'd consider buckeye a good tree, I know a lot of foresters see it as a mild type of a weed species of tree. Um, it's you know in in urban environments, it you'll see it commonly scorch. The leaves get scorched and burnt by midsummer, late summer. Just it's it doesn't tolerate heat and exposure very well. It tends to be more of a cool, shady, understory type of, uh, it's shade tolerant and it comes up on river bottoms. So it can be, you know, I, I love Buckeyes personally cause I got fond memories of uh, hunting and harvesting the seeds. Um, but it just, yeah, it would kind of depend on your specific objectives. All right, Billy, I'm gonna toss this one your way. Um, your top maybe three, options for replacing ash trees? Ooh. Um, so first off, I'm gonna go back to my site slide. Um, it's really tough to give a blanket kind of overview, or I guess a, a blanket recommendation for replacement trees. You have to match the species to the site. So where are you standing? Is it an urban area? Is it a, is it a rural area? Um, there's a really good pub if you search through the resource guide uh, about replacing ash. But um, again, it's really tough to make a um, kind of a blanket statement like that because it really depends on the site and what you're going for. So um, I'll kind of throw this to Riggs and Joe of what they've seen because they've been on the front line since this kind of hit, especially Joe, I believe, um, and kind of see what they have thought as, as successful ash replacements. Uh, this is Joe, and I'll I'll jump in there and just say one thing. I I I will say is maple trees are wonderful, and I love a good uh, sugar maple this time of year in town as much as anybody. But we are overplanting maples, and that's a tree that gets commonly pushed at nurseries. Especially, there's a specific brand of maple called Autumn Blaze, or they might go as Autumn Flame, or it's a Freeman maple, and it's a blend of a silver maple and a red maple. And if you know trees at all, you know those are both soft maple species. They grow incredibly fast, but they do not hold up very well at all to wind, ice, and snow uh, because they just have a really bad architecture and form. So beware of planting maples, but uh, you know, maples can be a pretty good shade tree still. I just, we, we've really overplanted them in a lot of communities. So I encourage people to look for opportunities to diversify um, coffee tree, Kentucky coffee tree is a really unique one that's pretty adaptable to a lot of sites. I have a swamp white oak in my yard and I absolutely love it because oaks as our state tree, it's, um, it's very durable. It's going to be long lived. It's fairly fast growing for an, for an oak and so is red oak, by the way, northern red and swamp white are my, kind of my two choice oaks right now for yard trees or urban ash replacements. And, um, Joe, I'll give you uh, Kentucky Coffee and Swamp White. I'm, I'm definitely a big fan of those two. So okay. I'll, I'll turn it over and let Riggs chime in if he wants to. Well, I've got another question for Riggs here. So what are some examples of management practices all, that are alternative to fire? Um, yeah, uh, so good question. Um, Joe uh, kind of touched on this, but um, so one thing you can do uh, is go in and take like a chainsaw or a brush saw and cut those those shade tolerant species um, or those invasive species like you saw in that photo uh, hand cut those and and treat them um, with some kind of herbicide um, other options uh, would be um, your more of a mechanical um, approach uh, using heavy equipment um, with something like a fecon head or like also called like a forestry mower on the front um, and just kind of clearing out that that understory. Um, another option uh, would be uh, targeted spraying, um, especially kind of how Joe said when um, when it's just those green honeysuckles uh, left, that would probably be a good time, good time to hit that with some targeted spraying. Um, and then also another option, uh, but you do need to be careful with this one. 
Oh no, he froze. You're back. All right. Okay. We got to be okay. careful with what? Uh, so grazing, you just you want to make sure to be targeted, but you can use grazing actually as a management tool um, to to open up those understories um, in in those uh, oak savannas. Um, I'll let Joe or, or Billy chime in if they had anything to add, but um, those are kind of my main four that I would say uh, you can use um, with fire or or instead of fire. All right. So there was a question here. We've got someone joining us from California. They're talking about that they've had diseases uh, killing the black walnuts. Is that any concern or if you've seen any of that coming to Iowa yet? We're going to toss that one to Joe. Um, he might be referring to thousand cankers disease. That's the newest crisis on the horizon when it comes to black walnut these days. It, it's, um, and it was, it was discovered maybe 10, 15 years ago in that time frame in the Southwest, Arizona, Colorado. Um, so the, the quick takeaway on thousand cankers disease is we are, monitoring for it. We have not found it in Iowa and we're certainly cautious of it, but uh, we're not quite as scared of it as maybe early on when it first came on the scene. It appears to be a little bit more benign and able to be overcome. So um, beyond that, we, we don't have any real important major pests of black walnut at the moment. We had a question come in. Um looking for some help or suggestions managing an oak hickory remnant in need of help. And I will say we'll be emailing out a uh, DNR forestry staff directory uh, that can help you find someone near you uh, that can help you. It might be someone like Joe, uh, depending on where you live or it could be someone else uh, elsewhere in the state, but I'll make sure that that gets sent out in the email following this. Um, and they'd be a good one to have those conversations specifically to your site. Um, so kind of related to um, that management of, you know, the understory, um, any herbicide recommendations or recommended chemicals to paint stumps uh, for cutting that honeysuckle to make sure it doesn't come back. So Liz, I'll, I'll chime in here. Again, it kind of depends on your resources and, and your site, but we got a really good pub we're sending out in the resource sheet with, for, with chemical control. Um, we use triclopyr, which is the chemical name. Um, Garlon is kind of the, the name you'd see in the stores, but um, we use that this fall on honeysuckle stumps with, um, and in the past that's been pretty effective, but I'll let Joe and, and Riggs share their advice too. Yeah, I like the triclopyr recommendation there, Billy, and I, I like the the recommendation to look at the resource sheet there for other alternatives. We've we've used glyphosate, you know, which is the generic or the active ingredient in Roundup at full strength, 41% to success uh, this time of year with honeysuckle. It doesn't work on everything. And some people have had mixed results with using glyphosate on cut surface treatments. But if you look at the label on most of those products, it'll tell you how to do cut surface treatments with glyphosate. And the reason I mention that is it's really easy to find. You can get it at almost any farm store, Tyson's, Blaine's, and it's pretty safe in the environment too, as far as, you know, leaching and flashback. All right, I've got a couple more questions here uh, as we wrap up. So there's a question about whether or not Iowa sinkholes are being, uh, is it a problem in Iowa of sinkholes being used as dump garbage areas? Um, you showed that picture there, Joe, of, of forested areas. Um, so is that a concern um, that can help? Billy, do you want to take that one from a water quality side? Yeah, um, I actually saw a presentation on this um, a few years ago, but in the northeast part of the state especially, they have kind of what's called like a karst topography or a very porous um, geology up there. So anything you do at the surface of the earth is almost directly connected to groundwater. Um, these are really common in like uh, the Appalachians and Kentucky and, and Florida as well, these sinkholes. Um, but they did experiments up there, they did research and 
um, basically using tracers. And they found that, um, yes, those sinkholes, what you put in there has a direct connection uh, to, the, to the groundwater resource, which many folks use for their, their drinking water supply. So you basically short circuit the, all the processes that uh, are, are found in the soil that can uh, mitigate those pollutants when you, when you dump um, either garbage or um, any kind of pollutant into those, into those um, geographic features. So I don't know about the extent um, of is this still a common thing, um, but they're definitely connected uh, to our groundwater. Um, to kind of add to what Billy said, um, I mean, if you still able to persist um, out there in, in the forest and, and add to that that pollution, pollution and pollutants. So we just got to be mindful of, of when we throw stuff out. Excuse me, I've got two more questions uh, before we wrap up here. Um, the first one, um, looking at, you know, an old windbreak, 100 plus, several trees have died and fallen. Um, the understory junk trees are growing as can uh, the canopy closes up, should I cut the mulberries and junk trees and plant replacement evergreens? Yes. <laughs> yes. Great answer. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how, how old if they were, if they, if they said how old of a windbreak it is, but windbreaks absolutely have a lifespan. And when the trees get to a certain point and they start to kind of fall apart, <clears throat> it's, it's time to replace it. And hopefully, in an ideal setting, you've got space adjacent to the windbreak to expand outward and put a new layer on, on the backside or the front side of the windbreak and give it 15 years to get established and then rotate and, you know, regenerate or renovate the other half of it. Right. We, in Iowa, we don't do windbreaks quite as well as they do if you look at Minnesota and the Dakotas. They've got like a three striped windbreak rotation on those farmsteads. And Billy, while you're adding links to the chat there, do you have one for your invasive species to help people identify what those look like? Oh, I do. That's also in the resource sheet, but I'll, I'll put it up right now. Okay. And I, I put up the chemical control one too. All right. So my final question before we wrap things up here, both of them are related to the landscape and topography. Um, one is the role of karst on the influence of forests. And can you show again um, where the savanna forest would be located on a slope um, compared to the terrain. Um, the influence of karst on forests. Um, I would just probably say it's a very shallow soil situation. Um, any kind of management or chemical application, you should be very careful because again, um, it's directly connected to our groundwater. There's not that that kind of buffer of, of the soil water um, processes. Uh, it goes directly into the karst and directly into the groundwater. Um, that's a tough one. You know, they're often associated, except for down in Florida, with hilly topography, you know, very steep topography. So that's going to influence your management too. But um, it's a very interesting question. I, I'd have to think about that some more. But I would just say, whatever you do, uh, with karst is just be cognizant that it's going to be directly linked to that groundwater resource. And then savannas typically located on the, the upper slope. Is that correct, Riggs? Uh, on that shoulder slope uh, a lot too. Um, so yeah, kind of on those transitional zones um, between that those more upland areas, which would often uh, traditionally be prairie, um, more open, less woody species, and then more toward your your valleys with your your rivers or or those side slopes that's um you get the oaks in between those areas um so a lot of times on those shoulder slopes excellent all right so we do have just a few more informational slides to share with you um i'll let joe address this one here while i put the cca information in the chat box for y'all yeah thanks liz so we currently have a project underway, which we got funding from the US Forest Service to do 
Um, if you are a landowner in any of those counties that are appearing on the screen now, and you're interested in getting a free packet of tree seedlings or shrubs from the State Forest Nursery, 200 count, uh, please, you can email me at that email address and I can get you a promo code. And I'm, I'm sorry to anybody who's not located in those counties. We do have some other promotions available from time to time um, around the state. And this just happens to be one that's geared specifically towards landowners in the Boone River and the upper portions of the Iowa River watershed from roughly Marshall County up um, that was focused on uh, the nutrient reduction strategy connections and water quality and putting canopy out there. So um, yeah, just email me if you're interested. And if you can't use 200 trees on your property, but you could use 25, you know, see if you can get a few neighbors or friends or family members who you could share those seedlings with. We can pay for the shipping. They'll arrive right at your door. You just need to go order what you want, uh, assuming they're available and everything is free. Thanks courtesy to the United States Forest Service and this grant that we were able to get for uh, planting trees to promote clean water. Excellent. So if you did attend today to get CCA credits, I put that information in the chat so you have that as well. But just a reminder to get that submitted by 5 p.m. today so that I can submit that for your credits. And lastly, we hope that you can join us a week from today on Thursday, November 5th at 1 p.m. Remember to set your clocks back so this will be Central Standard Time. Um, exploring the impacts of cover crops, tillage and nitrogen inhibitors on crop performance and water quality. So we're going to be taking a closer look at that next week and hope you can all join us then. So thank you all so much for coming today. Again, uh, check your emails this afternoon for the evaluation and the recording. Um, and share it with those that, that couldn't be